Welcome to Voice of the Vatican. Our top stories. Devastation in Ecuador. Aftershocks rattle residents and the death toll continues to rise after a 7.8 magnitude earthquake killed hundreds, left more than 7,000 injured and countless missing. Tribute to a Pope. The church commemorates two important anniversaries of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. The Suffering Church. The Patriarch of Jerusalem visits Rome and paints a picture of the persecution of Christians living in the Holy Land. And a Roman run. American seminarians and priests participate in the second annual Roman run, a 150-mile course across Italy to raise funds for the Suffering Church in Syria. I'm Ashley Narona in Rome, Italy, and you're watching Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV. In the wake of the tragic earthquake that rocked the country of Ecuador, the death toll continues to soar. As aftershocks continue to rattle the area, rescue workers have tirelessly dug through the rubble and ruins, searching for corpses trapped under the cement and debris, and clinging to any hope of life. 24,000 people were left homeless by the quake, making them vulnerable to dirty drinking water and disease. In addition, communication lines, transport links, sanitation services, and nearly 2,000 buildings were badly damaged. In the hardest hit areas, grocery stores are closed and parents struggle to find food for their families. Aid agencies from around the world have responded by sending food, makeshift shelters, mosquito nets, and clean drinking water. The lines of people in need stretch for miles at these aid stations. President Rafael Carrera said during a visit to the worst effective region that the cost of rebuilding is likely to be in the billions of dollars and that Ecuador will temporarily increase some taxes, sell assets, and may issue new bonds on the international market to fund the multi-billion dollar reconstruction. Among the victims were four sisters and seven postulants from the community of the servant sisters of the home of the mother in Playa Prieta, who ran a school there. All were buried under the rubble. Three of the sisters were rescued and survived, while the other eight community members sadly did not. Pope Francis, during his weekly papal audience, expressed his closeness to the people of Ecuador and assured them of prayers in their suffering. He's living a quiet life of prayer within the Vatican walls, but this week provided plenty of reason for celebration, as it marked two important anniversaries for Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. April 16th marked the former pontiff's 89th birthday. The young Joseph Ratzinger was born in Marketalin, Germany, on Holy Saturday of 1927. He spent his youth in Bavaria under the harsh Nazi regime, experiencing firsthand their hostile attitude toward the Catholic Church, when he, as a boy, saw his parish priest beaten before his eyes before the celebration of the Holy Mass. Yet the Ratzinger family remained rooted in their Catholic faith. Amidst this time of turmoil and destruction, young Joseph came to know and love the beauty and peace of Christ. And he and his brother Georg were ordained to the priesthood on the same day in 1951. In commemoration of his 89th birthday, Pope Francis tweeted, Today is Benedict XVI's birthday. Let us remember him in our prayers and thank God for giving him to the church and the world. The former pontiff celebrated his birthday by attending a special concert in his honor. The 19th of April marked the 11th anniversary since the election of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger to the papacy and the first German pope in nearly 1,000 years. Before being elected the 264th successor of Peter in 2005, he had been serving for 24 years as the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, appointed by Pope John Paul II in 1981. He also served as president of the Pontifical Biblical Commission and of the International Theological Commission. To get a personal insight into this great man of faith, I sat down with Bishop Guido Pozzo, the head of the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei at the Vatican. 
Bishop Pozzo was appointed to the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith in 1987 and worked very closely with Cardinal Ratzinger for almost two decades. Reminiscing on the blessing of their friendship, here's what Bishop Pozzo had to say about this theological giant. I learned profoundly about my priestly life while working with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And of course, I also learned a lot professionally. I worked for 18 years with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, the prefect of the congregation, and collaborated with him during the pontificate of Pope St. John Paul II. It was a very intense pontificate, and many documents were published of great value to the Church and of deep profundity. For me, it was like a school. I was like a disciple, one-on-one -on -one with the prefect of the congregation. Naturally, I learned so much from him, not only from a theological and doctrinal point of view, but also in interior discipline and sanctity. I also learned a lot about the rigorous application to theology and the dedication to resolve complex doctrinal issues concerning the promotion and the defense of the faith. And I received so much from him from the point of view of my priesthood, because Cardinal Ratzinger always knew how to unite aspects of doctrine with personal spirituality. It was not just an academic exercise. He participated deeply in the interior mystery of Christ and in the mystery of the Church. I am eternally grateful for his example. He was also a wonderful example of tremendous humility, because even with his vast, vast knowledge, he always approached theology on his knees. And when it came to contemplating the mysteries of God, he gave himself completely. He was always only consumed with the good of the Church. These are the lessons I hope that I have, at least in a small way, taken from him and which will always remain with me, even as bishop. It was Pope Benedict XVI who appointed me as bishop and then to the Roman Curia as the Alamoner and then Pope Francis, who appointed me as the secretary of the Office of Ecclesia Dei. In his retirement, Pope Emeritus Benedict lives inside of Mater Ecclesiae Monastery in the Vatican Gardens, and spends his time in prayer and contemplation, and in writing, and even enjoying his passion of playing the piano. In his retirement, he rarely makes public appearances. This week, his Beatitude Monsignor Fawad Twal, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, visited Rome to share the reality of the precarious situation faced by Christians living in the Holy Land. The Patriarch addressed the drastic decrease in the Christian population there, which has dwindled since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. The city of Jerusalem currently contains about 11,900 Christians, out of a total population of approximately 500,000 Jews and 300,000 Muslims. Painting the reality of what it's like for Christians living there, the Patriarch wondered aloud about the future of an eight-year-old child, traumatized by seeing his parents dying before him. He asked, who can make this child a normal and healthy citizen and help him to have love and respect for all others? For all these social and political reasons, which creates a general climate of existential insecurity, we are witnessing a veritable exodus of Christians from the Holy Land. They are mainly young people and intellectuals who flee the country in search of a more secure future and a more humane existence elsewhere. It is this bleeding that deprives the Church in Jerusalem of its best hope for the future. Patriarch Twal also spoke of the persecution and difficulties for Christian residents who are prohibited from freely crossing borders. The Arab Christians and the faithful of Bethlehem and other Palestinian villages cannot reach the holy places even with a permit issued by the Israeli military authorities. 
Seeing how the Palestinians pass the many checkpoints, pardon the expression, almost like animals, we see that we are very far from the respect for life and human dignity that the Church is hoping for. Faith is the foundation of hope of the Christians in the Holy Land. This means that for our part as the Catholic Church, we are called to action and humility, which is at the same time effective, humble, and dynamic. One day, political leaders, Israelis and Palestinians, along with the international community, will come to understand, beyond the game of political interests and ambitions, the sense, the nature, and vocation of this blessed land, chosen by God to unite men to himself and to each other. Let me renew the invitation to the Holy Land, which is the land of all, the location of the Mother Church for all Christians, and in the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem, you will always find a warm welcome and brotherhood. In a few minutes, we'll go up close for a special look at an ordination that happened in Rome, creating new Cyril Malabar deacons and subdeacons. And now, running for a cause. A group of American seminarians and priests living in Rome have decided to strap on their running shoes to help aid suffering Christians persecuted in Syria. How? They're raising funds by running across Italy. The men from various dioceses will begin the adventure on April 30th with an early morning mass. And then the race to beat the sunset begins. Two cars filled with eager participants will head out, one destined to a starting point on the Adriatic Sea, on the eastern coast of Italy, and the other headed westward to the Tyranian coast. From there, the 150-mile foot race takes off with a goal that the two teams will meet right in the middle of the country. Voice of the Vatican spoke with some of the participants who took time off from training to tell us more about this special grassroots event. It's very much been, I think, um, a work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit because it started with something just our, our natural desires, something that we were interested in together, just running. And God began to use that for his work and for his mission. Um, so, yeah, there were, we were all just a, a group of guys who enjoyed running together. And we started talking about how we wanted to do this big run across Italy together. And we all realized each of us were crazy enough to want to do this. Um, but as we... As we began praying with it um, and deciding that this was something real, this was something we could do, we realized that um, we wanted to make this a charity. So that's not just something that we would do for fun, but something that we can do to support the church in need. Um, because to, to help those to be one with those, recognizing that we are one body in Christ, and to rejoice with those who rejoice and to suffer with those who suffer. Last year exceeded any expectations that I had in what the day was going to be. I just started off with uh, an early, even groggy wake up. Um, we started off the day with mass. We came together. Um, and then very early on, we set out in two cars and set out in the two. One went to the east, one went to the west with our drivers and our four runners in each car. And from that point, we started at the same time and we just started running towards the center to meet in the middle. We had already spent time to map out the legs. And, and the way it works is, is that it's a relay race. And so you have one runner who will run about eight miles and the car will drop him off, pack up, and then drive off and meet him eight miles down the road. And so you cheer him on as you pass him down the road. And then in about an hour later, whenever he arrives, he knows the place. And so you're cheering him in and they slap hands and then the next runner will run off the next leg. And... Um, I think one of the things that I found that was so cool about the whole experience was really the camaraderie and the friendships that were born and that ability uh, to have fun and in, enjoy kind of achieving something that any one of us, it would have been impossible to do on our own. And yet all of a sudden, we're running 150 miles across Italy. And um, I, I think one of my favorite memories is... Um, Michael might share this too, is finally meeting in the center. It had been a long day of running of hills and valleys and sun and rain. And then just to finally get to the middle and just kind of rejoice at, we did this. Because at the beginning of the day, I don't know that we <laughs> all were really convinced of that. And then just to, to rejoice and, and that finally coming together and, uh, and sharing that moment. Yeah. 
The Roman Run has also given the participants opportunities for personal spiritual growth and to feel closer to the suffering church in Syria. Training for the Roman Run has been an experience for many of us in how prayer can become a part of every different uh, aspect of your daily life. Um, we have uh, friends and, and supporters and benefactors who we pray for while we run. And additionally, the people who we're raising money for and prayer support for um, are very much on our minds as we're training. So at the beginning of a run, we'll say a prayer for those who are behind us and who we're running for. And then even during the, the course of, of running, it's easy to call to mind um, a brother or sister who you might not even know, but just kind of give yourself that extra little push to make a sacrifice on their behalf. I think it's something that we'll probably take away for years to come, that prayer really can soak into even the ordinary events of daily life. The men hope to raise $10,000 to aid the church in Syria, and they're also asking for donations of prayer from all, especially for the church in that country. You can read more about the event on the website, www.gofundme.com slash Roman Run 2016. Coming up next, up close, a special look at a beautiful rite of ordination when Cardinal Alan Cherry ordained seven new Cyril Malabar deacons and eight subdeacons into the church. And a stirring photo exhibit in Rome zooms in on the human experience in the midst of horrific suffering and disaster. Did you like the program you just watched? Help Shalom World bring more programs like this to a global audience. Your support helps us share the peace of Christ with the world. Visit shalomworld.org forward slash donate. And now an up close look at a very special ordination that took place in Rome this week at the International Mater Ecclesiae Seminary. Seven new Ciro Malabar deacons and eight subdeacons were ordained by His Beatitude, Cardinal George Allen Cherry, the major archbishop of the Ciro Malabar Church. The special ordination liturgy is full of meaningful tradition, and every rite, ritual, prayer, and hymn is rife with deep theological symbolism. The rite begins with special prayers for the bishop, asking that his unworthiness may be resolved through the grace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, so that God might complete this great divine service through the bishop's feeble and unworthy hands. The role of subdeacons is one of service. They prepare the church and the faithful for the divine liturgy and read the prophetic books. The ordination rite of the subdeacons includes the presentation of the candidate to the bishop by the archdeacon and is followed by the tonsure where each candidate kneels down before the bishop as he cuts off a small piece of hair. The rite of tonsure comes from the Old Testament in Isaiah 7.29 and Numbers 6.18. It's a sign of purification and the beginning of a new life. As the bishop cuts the lock of hair of the candidate, he prays that Christ may remove all the burden and stain of sin. The rite signifies a conversion, a new beginning at the threshold of the subdeacon's new ministry. And while in this state of purity, the subdeacons face the new ministry with faithfulness to God and His covenant. The bishop prays for the purification of the candidate and invokes the graces, virtues, and gifts of the Holy Spirit as the subdeacon is then vested with a stole and receives a book of the Psalms and a cruet. In the Sir Malabar Church, there has always been this practice of having subdeacons, uh, men who are particularly ordained to serve at the altar. And now with the subdiaconate today, it continues to be that ministry, but also in progression as men move towards the priesthood. So today I received the subdiaconate and um, I was invested with this stall, which is a symbol of the priesthood, the priesthood being... Um, service towards God and towards the people. So I was invested with this stall today. Um, But ultimately, the subdeacon is one that serves at the altar. He is one that assists the priest and the deacon, who are the ministers during the korbana, the holy korbana. 
For the seven new deacons, the diaconal ordination rite has its origin in Acts 6, where the apostles laid their hands upon the elected candidates and appointed them to the ministry of the altar. It includes a profound series of rites and rituals, which begin by the ordinandi approaching the altar for the first time, one step at a time. Psalms 15 and 122 are sung, recounting the state of internal purity that one must be in to enter God's holy place and to constantly gaze up towards heaven. The bishop and the deacons are reminded to put their trust completely in God, the source of all spiritual gifts. The imposition of hands by the bishop has three parts and begins by invoking the theological attributes, the gifts from God, which are the graces needed to serve at the holy altar with a pure heart and conscience, so that as the new deacons proclaim the epistles during the liturgy, they may also glow with works of justice and charity, living exemplary lives as they dispense the divine life-giving mysteries. In a sign of total humility and submission, they prostrate themselves on the floor before being vested with the stole of the deacon and presented with a book of the epistles that they will use to proclaim the word. Eventually, each is led to the altar to kiss both sides as a sign of taking possession of the altar for the very first time. As they venerate the altar, the beautiful verses of Psalm 145 are sung as a sign of trust in God, who is always near to all who call on him in truth. It is he who fulfills the desires of all who fear him and preserve all who love him. And the psalm speaks the praises of his name and declares that all flesh will bless his holy name forever. The holy kurban of the Siro Malabar rite is very profound. It expresses the great mysteries of Christ. When we go through the liturgical um, rubrics and the symbols and signs, we see that during the Daikinet ordination, each step towards the altar is significant. Just as Jesus went up to the Mount Calvary, step by step, we deacons also go towards the Calvary, that is the altar, to sacrifice. And just as Mary was there beside Jesus in her presence, what I feel personally in this diaconate ordination is that Mary also was there along with me to climb each step, the one worthy, but with the help of God's grace. The ceremony concludes with the bishop praying for the newly ordained, that Christ, who has advanced them in their ministry, will also perfect them in the work of righteousness forever. The bishop calls on the intercessory prayers of Mother Mary and the saints, and then invokes the strength and blessing of all the glorious Trinity, that all help and goodness be bestowed as an aid unto these weak and humble servants both now and forever, through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. An exhibit of more than 50 photographs by the Czech photojournalist Jan Sibek has opened in Rome. His photos are from the heart of war zones and natural disasters, bringing awareness to some of the most horrendous global humanitarian tragedies of the last 25 years. Sibek has photographed wars in Afghanistan, Croatia, Bosnia, Kosovo, Georgia, Chechnya, Azerbaijan, South Africa, and Iraq, and has bravely documented the genocide in Rwanda, as well as photographing refugee camps in Tanzania, Sudan, Angola, Somalia, and Haiti, and even the desperate journey of refugees across land and sea. Each photograph tells a personal story of human suffering and an individual's or community's response to it. Jan Sibek is perhaps the Czech Republic's best-known photojournalist, and in two decades he has undertaken over 200 assignments around the world. The exhibition, sponsored by the Embassy of the Czech Republic to the Holy See and the Sovereign Order of Malta, will remain in Rome until the 28th of April, and will then travel to Milan, Brussels, and possibly Istanbul for the World Humanitarian Summit. There are whole new ways to boost your prayer power using smart technology. Now it's time for Techno.
You may have thought that you were too busy to do anything special for the Jubilee Year of Mercy, but the Catholic Publishing House of Our Sunday Visitor has found a way that the phone in your pocket can help guide you through your spiritual journey this year. The free app is called 365 Days to Mercy and invites users to explore the Jubilee Year's theme, Be Merciful Just as Your Father is Merciful. How? By offering lots of inspirational content. The content includes daily mercy reflections, special Year of Mercy texts, news stories, and a bookshelf section where you can read excerpts from books on the theme of mercy. You can also find practical suggestions for how to live out the Year of Mercy. And if you were wondering about things like, what's an indulgence? Or what do the holy doors actually mean? You'll find the answers there. The app also allows the user to keep up with the Holy Father's daily tweets. And there's even an entire section dedicated to music, where you can listen to songs with the theme of mercy, learn about the performers, and even download lyrics and sheet music to try out your own hand at playing the tune at home. The app is available in English, Spanish, and German, and for Android or iPhones. All week long, keep up with the latest happenings in Rome on our Twitter feed, at Voice of Vatican. Be sure to like us on Facebook, at Voice of the Vatican. And check our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice, too. Email your questions, stories, and news to us at vov at shalomworld.org. This is Ashley Narona with Voice of the Vatican. On behalf of the entire staff and crew of our show, we wish you a blessed week. May God bless you and your family. Saying ciao for now from the Eternal City, I'll see you next week on Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV.